Hello and welcome to another episode of Just in Time World. Today, I am interviewing Carl Wilcox, who runs the Draw Shield website, which allows you to create heraldic devices on your web browser. Carl, if you would introduce yourself and how you got into this. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, my name's Carl. I had a long career in IT, mostly working in commercial aviation, uh, and then took a career break. And about 10 years ago, realized that I needed to get into this web business with websites. So I bought myself a domain name and looked around for kind of something to learn web development, I wanted to learn how to do programming in PHP. And I remembered a project that I did back in my university days um, for drawing heraldic. It was very simple, but it took four of us um, oh, nearly six months to create this. And I thought, I'm sure with today's technology, I could, I could reproduce this in three days. Um, so I did, and that was kind of and 10 years ago, and, and I'm still working on it. Um, and I, I, I mean, the funny thing was, I, I just did it purely for myself as a learning exercise. I didn't promote it. I didn't advertise it or anything. I just kind of put it out there and said, look, I, I told a few people about it and I've done this and um, and it's kind of grown a lot. And now there's a there's a team of people helping me out and we're adding more and more to it all the time. The Draw Shield website is a spectacular resource. I use it all the time in my own world building. So if anybody has not yet discovered it, link down below in the description. First question that I have for you is what are the heraldic colors where do they come from and why do they have these funny names? Almost everything in heraldry has a, has a funny name when you get right down to it. <laughs> it's, it's a herald, the, the language of blazonry is a sort of strange car crash of, of French and Latin and English um, pronounced strangely. Um, but the, the colours come from a long way back in history. What you need to remember is uh, heraldry arose in the late 12th, early 13th century when there was no such thing as a, as a Pantone colour chart, or if there was, it would only had about six colours on it. Um, there weren't many kind of different paint colours or, or um, ways of colouring things available. The, the colours really were, were just what was around. Um, gold leaf was, was one of the possible colours. So you could, that's a nice gold, nice shiny colour. Um, you could you could scrap, you could smooth your, your shield out, you could smooth out your metal and it becomes all shiny and that looks a bit silverish. And you could make mm. some red colours and you can make some blue colours. Uh, and that's about it. There are just those, those real six basic um, colours from heraldry. Um, and the names are kind of sort of, and like I said, some come from French, um, mm -hmm. some come from, uh, from Old English, some come from Latin. Um, and, and some just they aren't they aren't really known. Um, each of them kind of has its own origin. If if you look in the um, if you look in a good heraldic dictionary, it will tell you where each of them came from. Um, but there's no there's no real common theme. Um, strangely enough, they they came from all over. As you'll suppose, is believed to have come from uh, an Arabic word. In fact, um, okay. But I why or for, for gold? I mean, that was the one that, that puzzles me the most. And every time I write it in a fantasy novel, I, I I'm like, I think in various languages, it, so it doesn't work. mean money. It's a coin. <laughs> um, uh, it's, okay. it's gold. Or French, a door is of gold. Uh, and so it, it's gold okay. of a coin. Um, but I think the important okay. point is that uh, what, what's quite useful today is uh, when you say ghouls, it, which is just red, uh, and it's mm. you know gu. It, it looks kind of French, but it's pronounced in the English way. It means yeah. any kind of reddish colour will do. Um, whereas okay. if you kind of say red, you, you'll somebody you'll immediately turn around and say, well, what's the RGB code? What, what RGB code are you using? <laughs> and that's not yeah. what Herald is about. Anything that's vaguely red is ghouls. Anything that's vaguely now, blue is azure, and that's fine. And but, that's that but sang sanguine is quite. It's also a colour in heraldry, and that's very close. It is less, it is less commonly used, and, and of course it means blood, and it also means red, but it's, yeah. a, it, it's a dark shade of blood. But again, you can't point to a Pantone colour and say, heraldically, that is sanguine and, yeah. and that is ghouls. If, it was, if it's a bright red, it's ghouls. If it's a somewhat darker red, it's sanguine. And a lot of the later colours, a lot of what are called stains, um, the, okay. um, like tenet and, and things like that, the various shades of brown and orange, are actually much later inventions. Um, okay. Remember, back in the back in the twelfth and thirteenth century, 
you could color something red, you could color something blue, and and, and maybe something green. And that was about it. That was a that was as far <laughs> as you had control over your over the, the way that you could color things. And so a lot of these later, more modern um, shades are are Victorian inventions largely. The hatching pattern, because that fascinated me. Yeah, um, again, it, it, it comes from the fact that um, uh, color printing. What, we didn't we didn't have color printers in the in the thirteenth century, um, yeah. and although you could illustrate a manuscript um, uh, with with colors, you know, you could we couldn't the colored inks were available. You needed a room full of monks to um, to actually produce <laughs> your your um, your and, and, and a lot of vellum uh, and a lot of ink and a lot of work to produce your colored illustrations. But we could make a dye, you could just use charcoal to, to sketch something. But obviously you've only got the one colour with charcoal. So the, the idea of um, the hatching is just to be able to show actual colours without having colours. It's like, a, a, like your monochrome printer, printing colours on a monochrome printer and just shading them that way. Um, okay. that, that's where that came from. And again, uh, colour printing is actually quite rare. Even, you know, up, up into the 1960s, most books didn't have very many colour plates. Uh, and so yeah. hatching was used to illustrate heraldry right up until the middle of this century. What is the difference between a fur and a colour? When you come to uh, colour something in, maybe a piece of a shield or a piece of a uniform or whatever, you've basically got two choices. You can use a flat colour, plain colour, that we've already talked about, or mm. we could put some sort of pattern on there. And a, a fur is an example of one of those patterns. Uh, there's a whole range of patterns defined in heraldry. Uh, the furs are, they're only really kind of special because the, the colours of the pattern are already defined. Um, mm. So I, I would, a fur is a pattern with a defined set of colours. Um, okay. There are other patterns available where you get to choose the colours, uh, mm. which are generally called treatments. So things like checky, to uh, a pattern of squares, you get to choose mm. the colours of that, but you don't get to choose the colours in uh, in a fur like ermine. Okay, so in furs you don't get to treat, choose the colours, but in treatments you do. That's correct, yes. Okay, that's very interesting. What about the positioning on the shield? Because when I use the site, I see, I see there's a lot of in face, in the chief point, in point on tree, in... <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, each position on the shield does have a name, more or less. There's about nine or ten areas. In fact, I, funnily enough, I just added a few days ago. I added a page to the to the visual catalogue on Draw Shield mm. to show people where positions are because I realised that we didn't really have that um, shown anywhere. Um, all, like I said, all lots of um, blazonry and heraldry is about terminology, and yeah. um, so the fess is the middle bit of the shield, the chief is the top, the base is the bottom, uh, and then you've got the middle and your dexter and sinister sides, which are from um, Latin. Dexter and sinister are just the Latin words for left and right. The complicated bit is the left-hand side of the shield is from the point of the view of the person holding the shield. So if I'm holding the shield, <laughs> the sinister side, the left-hand side is here because it's my left. But when you're looking at it, it's your right. So. Dexter and Sinister are reversed on shield, which confuses everybody. I mean, the nice thing about um, blazonry and heraldry is these terms are very consistently used. If mm. you see something, if you see the word sinister, it always means on the right hand side of the shield. Uh, yeah. And if you see something that says fess, it always means in the middle of the field. So if something yeah. is in fess, then it's in the middle of the field. If it's per fess, then it's split across horizontally. Um, mm. So it is quite. It's quite a well-defined language in, in most respects. Yeah. But once you learn the terminology, you can you can reuse it elsewhere. And George R. R. Martin actually does that in his books. That it's where I first encountered the heraldic language. Was it was very clearly defined. You know, the the banner was a such and such animal on a field of blah. Yes, that that's that. He does use correct blazon. Uh, yeah. He does use the correct language of blazon there. Yeah. yeah, I have read his books. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, and of course, the whole idea is it's a, it's a nice descriptive language to be able to tell your local peasantry who can't read who their lord is, what their lord's what their lord's badge is, what belongs to the lord because it's got their badge and their symbol on it. Indeed. So it, it is a a nice descriptive language as well. What is mantling? 
So that's the thing. Like all that decoration yes. around the now, shield and so on. There are there are two real uses of heraldry, um, and it's mm -hmm. uh, and it's best not to confuse them. The first and, and the oldest use of heraldry was purely identification. So. Okay. It, the, the classic example is given the identification of a, of a, a knight in armour on the on the field. You can't tell mm. who it is because he's got his helmet on. So you paint some something on his shield so that you know who that belongs to. And of course, that extends to um, his tent in the massive encampment. You know, mm. your page boys can't read. When you say, I want to take something to the Duke of Marlborough, then the Duke of Marlborough, you can describe to him, he has the arms, the, the black and white arms with the purple um, mm with the purple scallops on, you know, you can mm. describe what it looks like. So that that use of heraldry is purely for identification purposes. And we still mm. use that today, you know, we still have aircraft with a with a black cat painted on the tail, and that's the black yeah. cat squadron known as the black cats. You know, it, it's it's a quick and easy identification. And that was its first use. Okay. Um, the uh, later on it became it came to be used for ceremonial and decorative purposes and when that happened just you know my a, a picture of my shield with a with a vertical mm. striper that's a bit dull really isn't it i i, I <laughs> want to embellish that and make it look more important and that's okay. when you make the distinct or I, I tend to make the distinction between the shield and yeah a full achievement of arms and the achievement of arms <laughs> is where you've got your men clinging, you've got your crest and you've got your supporters holding your shield up and you're, you're all standing on a shelf. That's purely decorative ceremonial stuff. And so, that's so when it's you basically bring in the medieval, the mantling. Yeah, so um, it's the medieval equivalent of like flexing or your pizzazz. Yeah, oh, exactly, <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. yeah, so it's the decorative purpose versus the, the purely functional. Yeah, the functional purpose of, is on the if, you're, if you're putting a, 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 a fantasy game together, I think mm. it's important not to mix those two things up. You know, yeah. on, on the battlefield, your soldiers will be wearing the red and the blue, and that's it. You know, if your colours are red yeah. and blue, your soldiers will have red and blue. They won't have the, the, the big, the, the, whole, the whole achievement sewn into the mm. interval. That's not how it works. That's not what it's for. The big yeah. achievement is on your tapestry at, at the far end of your... Of your solar in your Ooh. castle, you know, that, yeah. and carved into the into the doorway over uh, above it. So the two things are very separate. Heraldic signs. Where do they come from? All of those deers and dragons and in in trepant and in all of these terms. <laughs> um, again, when you, I, I like to start at the beginning, which is you know, mm -hmm. in the beginning. Uh, heraldry was just a way of recognizing people. There weren't many people that you needed to recognize. So there were all you needed was, well, if, if that guy's got his diagonally split red and blue, well, I'll do mine with white with a with a red um, with a red cross on it. You know, the, the, you didn't need to have that many variations because it was the only people who had heraldic symbols were the king and his, you know, 50 or 100 uh, leading knights and lords. Um, but as more and more people liked the idea of having a coat of arms and having heraldry, there weren't enough colours to go around, there weren't enough simple geometric shapes to go around, uh, and people started adding little pictograms almost. Uh, I think that's quite a good word for them. Pictures of easily recognisable things. Now, okay. again, in, in medieval England, the sort of things that people put on their shields were common wildlife, things that they saw around them, household objects and uh, that's so that's where they all came from and again when you needed yet more variation let's not just have a goat let's have a goat standing on its hind legs you know or a bear <laughs> walking along so yeah all of these variations came along again more for the decorative purpose if you think about it on a battlefield if you're if you're in the middle of the battle, you're not really going to notice whether the bear is is rampant or static. You know, it, it's a bear. <laughs> it's a bear. That's all you need to know. It's, it's, it's a bear. It's a bear or it's not a bear. <laughs> yes. So all of that kind of frippery almost was was mm. added for decorative purposes. Okay. Um, but sometimes people took used symbols that uh, were a play on their names, a pun on their names. Mm. These are sometimes called canting arms or elusive arms. Uh, okay. We can't always tell what these things were. Uh, sometimes they were they were incredibly obvious. 
um, mm. uh, you know, like the um, the Fox family have got foxes on their, you know, sure. on their sh- sometimes sometimes it's very obvious and, and you know you know it. Sometimes it's actually quite obscure. Mm. The De Lucy family has got three pikes, the fish, on their shield, which. Oh, fair enough, it's, it's, it's easily recognisable, <laughs> but if you actually dig back a bit, in Old English, uh, one of the names of the pike, the fish, is a loose. So, you know, it's a play on words, but you wouldn't, Very clever. you wouldn't know that. And and a lot of these things actually have been lost to history, that the reasons why a particular family has a particular symbol on there, mm. there may have been a reason for it. We don't know what it is, or it may just have been well, oh, they've already used the fox, they've used the badger, they've used the bell, <laughs> what could you, I don't know. Let's use a cushion. Because <laughs> yeah, we, we that's what's there. <laughs> we, don't know the, we don't know the reasons for everything. Yeah. And it, and it may just have been, uh, I mean, people do look for meanings in all of these things. Um, but naming, naming things is hard. And sometimes the Lord could just have said, you know what, I, I saw a squirrel. Let's put a squirrel yeah, exactly. on the uh, Exactly right, <laughs> yes. And obviously yeah. there, there were a lot of mythical creatures as yeah. well. Um, even lions, actually at the time, lions were mythical creatures. There are lions yeah. on, the, um, on the coat of arms of England from, back from the 12th and 13th century. Yet if you look at them, if you look at how they're drawn, it's perfectly clear that whoever drew them had never ever seen a lion in their entire life, and they are long and thin, and uh, <laughs> and, and yes, they've got claws, but uh, and they've got a tail. But it's like some—it's a third-hand description of a lion. You know, it's those those games that you play where, the, where somebody describes something you describe it to somebody else, and in the end they draw it. They were just as mythical as as harpies and griffins. Up here in in Finland, our our coat of arms has got a lion with a sword going into its mouth and flowers around its face. And we call it the spastic lion because that's exactly what it looks like. I, I have sympathy for those uh, English guys drawing a lion from like yes. accounts from Africa. Yes. In Catherine Kerr's work, who's one of my favorite authors, there's a central bardic guild who controls what heraldic devices may be used and, and keeps keeps track of who's using what device so that there's no overlap. How was that done historically? The king, one of the early kings in the third century, I'm quite, not quite sure who, set up the, the marvellously named Court of Chivalry. And, and their role was to rule on matters of heraldry. And in fact, one of the early cases, there were two families, both of whom were using, and this was in early days, because the shields were both very simple, mm. both families were using a blue shield with, with a yellow diagonal stripe, which is azure, mm-hmm. a bend, or, and they were both using it, and they both claimed, well, it's ours, and the case went to the court of chivalry for them to rule on it. Justice did not grind any faster in those days. It actually took something about three years to come up with a ruling, and they looked at <laughs> who, did, who did this first, you know, who'd got documentary proof of who was using it first. Uh, and eventually it sounds years, like a copyright out, claim. Yeah, the, <laughs> the court of chivalry ruled that this this particular coat of arms belonged to the Scrope family. The other family couldn't use that arms, and in fact, they they changed theirs to be uh, a garb. And that was that was the role of the court of chivalry. And in order to kind of stop this happening, um, they would go on a procession. They would go around the country, and they would write down all of the coat of arms that people were using, so that if somebody wanted to register a new one they could compare it with what they've got. And in fact, this is where the language of blazonry actually came from. Because if yeah. you've got to make a, a list of all the all the shields, well, you could you could collect an example of each shield and stick it in your wagon and, and bring your wagon back with all the shields. But that's that's a bit heavy. Or you could you could take yeah. your monk with you and get them to draw it, or you could take ladies of the court and get them to embroider it. It's all it's all too hard and difficult. So they invented they created the language of blazonry, all this profess and, and mm. stacks trip on and all that stuff. So they could write down a shield description. So somebody came up to them and said, I've done some service for the queen and she's made me a lord. I want a coat of arms and I'm going to use this. Then yeah. the court of chivalry can compare it with all the others and say, and say yes or no. And the court of chivalry amazingly still exists and, and still has power and still has, still has statute power in the UK. The last time they actually sat, I believe, was sometime in the 1960s when somebody used the coat of arms, I think it was the coat of arms of Manchester Metropolitan Council, uh, and, and they used it for their own purposes, and they were taken to the Court of Chivalry and basically said, no, you can't use that, those arms belong to the Court of Chivalry. Many countries, yeah. many European countries, 
have, it's not just a case of copyright with coats of arms. There are a completely separate, very old set of statutes about mm. using coats of arms and that only the, only the official holder can use a coat of arms. Yeah. And it's not just a case of copyright. It is the, the, the people from the Court of Chivalry will come and, and, and lock you up in the, in the Tower of London for the rest of your natural <laughs> life. <laughs> I believe that you have to have, I mean, you have to have a right to have a coat of arms. Just because you're a human doesn't entitle you to a coat of arms. Is that It's become true? a bit more egalitarian these days. I mean, okay. it used to be the, the landed gentry can can mm. have a coat of arms. I believe nowadays more as anybody can if you if you can pay the money and and be bothered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it it, it always comes money. down to pay the money. <laughs> it does come down to fame and money. Yes, yes. <laughs> People who are knighted who get honours like to have like to then have a, a coat of arms. Um, well, one would imagine, like if you yeah. if you've actually earned a, a knighthood, that that it would be worth it for you to to yes. invest in a coat of arms and be like. This is my swanky, flexy coat of arms. Exactly, yes. One of the things I noticed on the site as well is there's all these different shield shapes, and some of the uh, blazons look quite different on the shield shapes. What, what's the story behind that? There, there are two reasons. Firstly, different countries have different traditions for shield shapes, which is why many of them have, many of them have um, country names. So I, there's a Swiss shield or a French shield. Some of them are. Some of them have reasons behind them. Um, the German shield it kind of looks like a jug in profile, but actually it isn't. The, the purpose of the German shield shape is it's got a little notch cut out the side through which you can stick your spear. So that that's actually there's a reason behind that shape. Other shield shapes are just because the different countries have got different positions and, and just define them a different yeah. way. So okay. draw shield supports lots of different country shield shapes mm. the other thing that we have done with draw shield is i realized that if you can put if you've got a language that can describe colors and, and positions mm. of things on a shield it can also describe colors and positions of things on other things so yeah. kind of non heretically draw shield can also draw flags there's a lot of yeah. commonality between flags so we can do a flag shape and actually you can specify the, the aspect ratio with that flag, however age you want it mm. tall or wide, all of that's specifiable. And then we also added silly things like um, Warhammer pauldrons, uh, <laughs> and we support all the Warhammer symbols that go on the on the shoulder. <laughs> and then I thought, well, if you might do, we can do uh, we can do stamps. So you can describe yeah. a stamp shape. Oh, and also tartans. I hadn't realised that tartan mm. has a define. There's a language for defining what tartans are. You know, the Scottish the material that that's very interesting. Yeah, builds out of. Uh, and there's actually a predefined, there's a language that describes what your kilt looks like. And, and, and I, well, that's very much like draw shield. So draw shield can also draw that's, tartan patterns as well. And that's, um, that's kind of why there's such a variety of shapes and things. I am astonished by what goes in the gallery. I started yeah. the gallery like 10 years ago with, with five different things just to kind of, look, here's, here's, a, here's a few examples of what, People can do. If any people got any ideas, then then send them in. Mm. And there's now nearly six thousand entries in this gallery, and the uh, the degree of creativity has just astounded me. Not all of it, is, you know, strictly heraldic. But what I have tried to do in Draw Shield is make it clear these are the these are the genuine heraldic bits. Mm. These are mm. the extensions that I've added, either because they're useful or because they're fun. I think that we have come to the end of the interview is there anything about heraldry that you would like to add as a last thought i i just like to um encourage people to try and learn the language of blazonry it, it's an interesting subject uh, and i i enjoy it and particularly if you're in europe open your eyes and look around you there is heraldry everywhere in europe on buildings on uh, on street signs on headed notepaper on products actually have a look uh, follow things around on um, on street view and just keep your mm. eyes open and you'll see heraldry everywhere um, and that's what I, i'd encourage people to do uh, see it and, and and learn about it so, and and if you want to learn about it draw shields as good a place as any so. absolutely agree everybody this has been carl cox and another interview by just in time world thank you very much for your time and see you in the next one